long, long chapters today. So, uh, and there's two of them. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, first chapter is about uh, methods of studying culture and psychology. This one's kind of interesting. I need to warn you there's a little bit of nudity in this, but uh, we're talking about dealing with other cultures, and some other cultures don't have the same um, sexual proclivities, uh, sexual mores that, uh, that the Diné people have. So that's, that's just a warning. Uh, what, should, uh, what should always be the initial step in studying uh, people from other cultures is to learn something about the culture under study. A little bit of knowledge can go a long way in avoiding costly and embarrassing mistakes. Schwader and his colleagues in 1997 were researching family meals. They sought information from rural India and called, upon, uh, called ahead to optimize their time there. Though people in this area of rural India did not participate in family meals, an obliging local psychologist convinced a family to sit down at a table to simulate what the researchers were looking for. The researchers happily recorded their discovery and mistakenly included it in, in their research. And that's what they saw. But that's not the way they eat in this part of India. This is the way they eat. Men eat on one side uh, and women eat on the other side with their children. One can learn about another culture in a variety of ways. The simplest way is to read existing texts and ethnographies about the culture. However, learning about a culture through books and ethnographies limits you to learning about the ideas the author thought were relevant. Um, let me give you a quick example. There, uh, at Fort Belknap, uh, there is the Catholic Church came uh, to the area in the 1880s. And one of the things that they did uh, was uh, write an ethnography about uh, the Grovan people, uh, who are now referred to as the Aani, uh, the Aani Nen. Um, the interesting thing was it was the uh, priest's uh, interpretation of uh, what uh, dealing with the uh, Aani people. Uh, and a lot of it is, is relatively inaccurate. And I had this uh, uh, question for uh, the people that were swearing that this was exactly what happened uh, back in the 1870s and 1880s. Uh, I asked them, uh, is, is, do you think that's, that's correct? Are you sure that's, that's accurate? And they told me that uh, there is, that agrees to some extent with uh, the oral traditions, but each family had their own traditions. Uh, so they were, uh, they were generalizing and saying that that was fairly accurate. Another approach is to find a collaborator who is uh, from the culture uh, you are studying and who is interested in, the pers in pursuing the same research with you. Uh, the more involved you, your uh, collaborator is in the project, the more likely that you will get accurate information. The International Association of Cross-Cultural Psychology is an organization of researchers studying culture and psychology from, uh, from all around the world, and its members routinely find members from other countries to collaborate with on cross-cultural projects. Another effective strategy is to immerse oneself in another culture to learn it firsthand. This is an excellent way to gain a rich understanding of another culture, but it can be time-consuming and costly. There is no substitute for first-hand experience, but of course, walking around naked just like uh, the people in the area, probably not the best idea. Uh, you should at least maintain your own culture. In 1997, Patricia Greenfield was doing field research about the making of textiles in Mexico. She gave the Zinacantecos uh, women the same survey about their textile making that she had used all over the world. The women became angry. The Zinican Tecos women approached the survey as they would a conversation. When Greenfield asked similar questions, a methodologically sound interview technique, they thought she was stupid or making fun of them, and it made them angry. Having your methods perceived in identical ways across different cultures is, ter is termed methodological equivalence. 
Sometimes researchers have to adapt their procedures so that it is understandable in each culture equally. The vast majority of cross-cultural research has been conducted between industrialized societies. The most common com comparisons are between North Americans and East Asians. Studying college students from different cultures also lends itself to making meaningful comparisons. As students the world over tend to be familiar with many of the kinds of procedures used in psychological studies, the college students tend to be an accessible sample for most uh, university researchers. And this is one of the things that you need to remember when you're looking at any research, whether it's psychological research or any research, uh, most of the time uh, they're using the, the, most, the, the cheapest and the most available uh, population they can possibly find. And a lot of times that involves college students. Well, most college students are traditional college students, somewhere between 18 and, and uh, 21 or 22. Uh, so sometimes their ideas aren't the same as somebody in their late 20s or early 30s or 40s or 50s or 60s or 70s. Uh, so, so they're only accurate as far as that goes, as far as talking about college students. And that's one of the things that you have to remember. When researchers overemphasize college students, there tends to be a significant problem with generalizability. The research can't be generalized with any population but other college students. Overusing students affects power. The power reflects the quality of the design of the study and determines if your design is sensitive enough to identify the anticipated effects. Sometimes the hypothesis is correct, but the design doesn't have the power to be able to provide support for it. And this is kind of a problem with, uh, with researchers. Uh, researchers only have a select amount of money, and, and usually they are college professors. Um, so th they don't want to hear the fact that uh, college students may not be uh, general generalizable, uh, a generalizable population. The other thing that you have to remember about college students is these are the best and the brightest, theoretically, of, uh, of, of a population. So the, uh, especially in the old days, uh, and I, when I say old days, <laughs> I'm 73. So when I was in college, um, despite the fact that Vietnam was going on, a lot of people were, were using uh, the 2S deferment to stay out of war. Uh, there were a lot of, uh, most people, um, graduating from high school, tried to find a factory job uh, to go to so that they could make money and they could get married and, and have children and whatnot. Uh, but my point is that the only people going to college at that time were the people that had plans to become doctors, lawyers, uh, college professors, uh, teachers, uh, veterinarians. Although um, if you wanted to go into business, you, you normally didn't go to business school. That didn't become really popular until until the uh, end of the 20th century uh, and now business colleges are, have the vast majority of, uh, of students uh, at, at any in institution. In cross-cultural studies, culture should always be an independent variable. If researchers contrast two similar cultures, they would not have as much variance in their independent variable as if they had compared two very dissimilar cultures. And of course, these are flags. This is the flag of Ghana. This is the flag of uh, Great Britain. This is the flag of the United States. And that's the flag of China. So th theoretically, she's British, he's Ghanaian. She's American and she's Chinese. But she doesn't look very Chinese to me. I don't know. Uh, psychological concepts uh, do not always translate from one culture to the next. The Japanese ame has uh, no equivalent in English, inappropriate behavior that shows dependence on someone else. Um, uh, it, it's kind of like being codependent, uh, except one, one person is a little bit more abusive than the other individual. The one person is abusive uh, and seems to ignore the other individual. Uh, it would be a, an example of ame would be if somebody had to walk four steps behind somebody else. Uh, that would be ame. Uh, that's that's the way it works. Uh, if one individual um, bathed the other individual, that would be ame. Um, it, it's it's really kind of difficult to talk about. 
<laughs> because we don't have it in the United States, not, not under those terms. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a form of codependence. Uh, German schadenfreude uh, has no equivalent in English. It's a pleasant feeling from seeing someone else's pain or someone else's failure. Uh, that's known as schadenfreude. And we really don't have that kind of a word in English. People may get pleasure out of somebody else's failure, but uh, we don't have a word for it, I guess. Uh, Ephalic, uh, fago uh, has no equivalent in English. Fago is a, a mark of maturity that shows compassion for the weak and love and sadness for them. The Chinese have no translation for the word self-esteem. This is a sign seen in a Chinese hotel. Please don't accept Strangler's invitation so as not to be cheated. And they're actually, they misspelled Strangler. It should be Stranger. Uh, sign in a Chinese store. Please don't touch yourself. Let us help try you out. And of course, they didn't really, that kind of see, sounds a little prurient. Uh, but the reality is they're not that's not what they're talking about they're not talking about somebody uh, uh, touching themselves not really <laughs> sign in a cambodian hotel wishing you a bong voyage uh, bong of course is a uh, an instrument for smoking marijuana uh, they don't really mean that they mean bon voyage which is a french word for good voyage Sign in a Hong Kong bathroom for keeping toilet clean and tidy. Please dump at the dustbin. They didn't mean go to the bathroom in the dustbin. They meant throw all your toilet paper in the dustbin, which is very common in Asian countries where you don't flush toilet paper down the toilet. Uh, sign on a Japanese street. When carrying a parasol, please be careful to get in the way of other people around you. Please get in the way of other people around you. They don't think that's what they mean. Please be careful not to get in the way of other people around you. Uh, sign at a Japanese drugstore. We make up prescriptions. No, you don't. What you actually do is fill prescriptions. Uh, make up is the wrong term. Sign in a Bucharest hotel lobby. Uh, the lift is being fixed for the day for the next day. During that time, we regret re, we regret that you will be unbearable, which means. Unbearable has two meanings. It means you can't carry them, and it also means that they are impossible to get along with. Uh, sign in a Paris hotel. Please leave your values at the front desk. I don't think they meant valuables, and they said values. Sign in an Athens hotel. Visitors are expected to complain at the office between the hours of 9 and 11 a.m. daily. In other words, if you have a complaint, you need to go there at between 9 and 11 not that everybody has to complain, has, have to find, has, has to find something to complain about between 9 and 11. Uh, sign in a Japanese hotel. You are invited to take advantage of the chambermaid. That's not exactly what they meant. They meant uh, the chambermaid uh, will help you, uh, will clean your room, not that you can take advantage of them, which sounds kind of prurient once again. Sign in a Paris uh, dress shop. Dresses for street walking. Street walking is another name for prostitution. Uh, street walkers are prostitutes that uh, that walk around, uh, walk on the streets and look for for uh, people that will hire them to have sex with them. It's kind of an interesting picture. Um, when we were in Germany, we were in Germany from seventy nine to eighty two. Uh, prostitution is legal in Germany. Uh, they have actually have brothels in Germany. Uh, but uh, you could tell if somebody was a street walker because they crossed their ankles. This is not the easiest way to stand, of course, but if it was a woman that was dressed up like she is and she had her ankles crossed, it meant that she was open for business, uh, as it were. Um, and that's really something, of course, you don't. In the United States, you wouldn't have a clue because prostitution is illegal everywhere except in, in Nevada, in some counties in Nevada. But uh, that's how you stand if you're a prostitute in, uh, in France and Germany and Belgium and Holland and whatnot. 
Uh, sign in a German campground. It is strictly forbidden on our Black Forest camping site that people of different sex, for instance, men and women, live together in one tent unless they are married with each other for that purpose. In other words, <laughs> don't want people who aren't married uh, to <laughs> sleep in the same tent. Soviet Weekly newspaper, there will be a Moscow exhibition of arts by 15,000 Soviet Republic painters and sculptors. These were executed over the past two years. They didn't execute 15,000 painters and sculptors. Uh, they actually did their paintings and sculptures over the past two years. Uh, sign in a Mallorca, Mallorcan shop. Here, speeching American. They speech American there. Which is kind of exciting. Mallorca is a, uh, I think it belongs to Spain. It's an island in the in the Mediterranean Sea. Mallorca, it's a famous um, uh, vacation destination for people in Europe. Uh, even for relatively fluent speakers, word choice can be a problem. The most commonly used method of ensuring that the translation is accurate is to have someone translate the translation back into English. This technique is known as the back translation method, at least you can imagine. Uh, if you have had this problem uh, dealing with English and uh, the Dene language, uh, then I guess it makes sense to you that, yeah, maybe I need to get somebody to translate this back so that I can see if this is what I meant to say. Response biases are factors that distort the accuracy of a person's response to surveys, and they become especially problematic when we compare groups that differ in their response biases. Some people will try to seem more socially desirable in their answers and disguise their true feelings to appear more socially desirable. There's a tendency for people from different cultures to vary in terms of how likely they are to express their agreement in a moderate fashion. Choosing an item close to the end of the scale, extremely biased. Choosing an item in the middle of the scale, moderacy, Bias. And these are uh, these are the ways. And this is one of the things that they do. I was taking a survey the other day, and they had a question in there just to make sure I was paying attention. Uh, they said, uh, "Mark, uh, you know, mark something in the middle, or mark something uh, at the extreme uh, of the uh, of the question, uh, just just so that they could see that I wasn't I was paying attention to the questions instead of just marking them." randomly. And if you, some people will just say, oh, I strongly agree. Jeez, I agree on this one point. So don't ask me any other questions. I'll just strongly agree on all of them. That would be known as extremity bias. And some people go, jeez, I hate these servants. Dog, and I'll just mark everything in the middle. Uh, moderate, 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 moderate. And that's moderacy bias. African Americans and Hispanic Americans tend to give more extreme responses than Americans of European descent. East Asians tend to be more moderate in their responses than the European Americans. East Asians show a greater uh, moderacy bias when they complete the materials in their native language than when they complete them in English. One way to fix moderacy bias and extremity biases is by having the uh, respondent answer yes or no, rather than using a Likert white scale. Though it is hard to quantify yes and no answers, and of course this is a problem for statisticians, it's either a yay or a nay, and there's nothing in between. A tendency to agree with most statements is known as acquiescence bias and is an issue for cross-cultural comparisons. The acquiescence bias is a problem for cross-cultural research because Cultures differ in their tendencies to agree with items. East, a <clears throat> excuse me. East Asians tend to have a relatively holistic way of looking at the world. <clears throat> and one consequence is that there are more possible truths in a holistic world. This tends to make them see truth in most statements, and for that reason, they have a hard time disagreeing with them. People tend to evaluate themselves by comparing themselves with others, and the people that we compare ourselves with are the people that we have the most uh, uh, time, we spend the most time with, and those are the similar others to us. 
<clears throat> when we are assessing ourselves in terms of how tall, how intelligent, uh, or punctual that we are, <clears throat> what matters is how tall, intelligent, or punctual we view ourselves compared to most other people around us. And this is really kind of interesting, because where I come from in Indiana, the people aren't very tall. I can remember while I was growing up, if we had a six foot two center on our basketball team, he was tall. He was really tall. <clears throat> but I've lived in places where everybody's tall, like Oklahoma or Montana. Those people, uh, so I, I was working on uh, Indian reservations uh, in, in both of those places, <clears throat> or, or working with a lot of American Indians. And those people are buffalo hunters. And I'll tell you what, buffalo hunters are tall people. Uh, especially up in, in Montana. It was really kind of interesting going to a basketball game between, you know, the, uh, the uh, Sioux of uh, Fort Peck and the Grovon and the Cinnaboyne of, uh, of Fort Belknap because it would be like, you know, five centers squaring up against each other. It was really kind of bizarre. Or, you know, going down there to the Crow Reservation and watching a basketball game between... Uh, Fort Belknap and uh, the Crow Reservation. Really kind of interesting. Really tall people. Blackfeet are tall people, too. Tend to be tall. Small feet. It's really kind of weird. Reference group effect is critical for cross-cultural research because people from different cultures tend to evaluate themselves by comparing themselves to different reference groups and thus to different uh, standards. Understanding the reference group conundrum, the researchers should always be aware of the reference group effect. Who is your reference group? Uh, I was watching my grandson play soccer the other day. He's got brown hair. Uh, just about everybody on the team has <laughs> blonde hair. I mean, not just blonde hair, but there's one kid whose hair looks white. Uh, so he, he looks like the, he's got the darkest hair on the team, which is a little bizarre because his hair's not really that dark. It's just kind of a uh, sandy brown color, but he, he looks like the uh, the little dark-haired ha child. I guess he is kind of a dark-haired child. Uh, one classic example of reference group effect was a study done looking at African-American soldiers in 1949, while the South was still suffering through Jim Crow. The soldiers were less satisfied about living in the North than living in the rep repressive South. Could it be that they didn't like the better treatment and the obvious freedoms that they found in the North? Uh, with analysis, they found that the soldiers gave their answers because they were using local African Americans as their reference group. Because African Americans were better off in the North than the South, the soldiers' life was more satisfying in the South by comparison. They were being treated very well on base, of course, but when they went off base in the North, uh, the... Uh, uh, the, everybody was treated equally, and so they weren't, didn't feel like they were being treated better. But in the South, where uh, African Americans are treated really, were treated really poorly, and not especially treated well, uh, even to this day. But uh, at that time, of course, when they compared themselves, boy, I'm sure glad I live on base, uh, they felt better about about living uh, on a southern base than they did uh, living on a, on a northern base because the treatment was worse, but it was better than the people that the other African Americans that they were around. And this has to do with reference group. When asked how much people valued enjoying life and pleasure, the results showed that the dower. East Germans, who you couldn't get them to smile unless blood was involved, scored the third highest on the survey. Now, this didn't make any sense. I've been to East Germany when East Germany was East Germany, and these were not happy people. They never, ever smiled. Uh, they were afraid to laugh because they were afraid somebody was listening to them, and they were afraid that somebody would think that uh, uh, they were making fun of the of the East German government. I mean, it was just really kind of odd. But here they are; they are enjoying life, and they their pleasure uh, level is is much higher. It's the third highest of all the countries that they looked at. Now, why in the world would that be? Italians who maintain a lifestyle emphasizing good food leisurely breaks in cafes, opera, art, and long summer vacations came in next to last on the enjoying life and pleasure scale. Now, this makes absolutely no sense. 
these Germans, who you can't get to smile unless somebody is, is bleeding to death. Uh, it's funny. This isn't a funny story, uh, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Uh, I, when I was uh, in Germany, I played on the the uh, base softball team, and we went to eat. We went to Berlin to play against uh, the uh, the Air Force base uh, in Berlin, and of course we were walking around, and and uh, we got to the Bahnhof, which is the uh, train station, and um, and there was just this huge crowd of people. And we couldn't figure out what was going on, and and uh, we kept asking people, "What's going? What's happening? What's happening?" And it turned out this guy was having a heart attack, and everybody wanted to come in and watch him die. Uh, as odd as that may seem, uh, they they were packed in so tight in there that when the ambulance came, people wouldn't get out of their way. They couldn't. The uh, the ambulance crew couldn't get there. The man had already died by the time the ambulance crew got there. And I was thinking, oh, this is the dumbest thing in the world. But then again, of course, that's Berlin and that's uh, that's Germany. Uh, they they just wanted to watch the guy die. They had well, never seen anybody die before, you know, one of those kind of deals. And of course, the Italians are really, really happy people. I don't know if you've ever been around these people. Uh, I'm not talking about uh, uh, the Godfather, of course, but uh, really, really happy people. Um, so what's going on it has to do with reference groups. Who in the world uh, is your reference group? And this is known as a reference group effect. Uh, on the humility scale, the arrogant Americans scored higher on the scale than the humble Chinese. The collectivist Chinese scored higher on the choosing one's own goal scale than the individualistic Americans, which is like the opposite of the way the world works. The deprivation effect involves people valuing things they have little of, of rather than what they have in abundance. Thus, since there is a dearth of humbleness among Americans, they value humility more than the Chinese who are taught humility from birth. Everybody's got humility in China, so why would you value it? <clears throat> Subjective self-report measures work fine within cultures because cultural members tend to share the same response biases and reference groups. But subjective self-report measures do not work well between cultures because the members have different response styles and different reference groups. So you can't compare these two uh, different individuals, different cultures. Cross-cultural studies are possible, but one variable that can not be manipulated is cultural background. The comparisons of cultures are not true experiments, but quasi-experiments. Culture cannot be controlled, but other independent variables can. And of course, that's what I was doing with, uh, with my research. Where I was looking at resilience, I had a scale that was developed in Washington State uh, with older individuals, uh, and I was looking at uh, different factors such as education, gender, age, uh, education level, did I already say that, um, trauma level, and culture. Uh, and and uh, I put them all together to, to find out if this culture really was resilient. And my answer was, of course, yes. Uh, after random assign randomly assigning subjects to groups, a researcher can administer different levels of the independent variable to each group. Any differences in their responses or behaviors that are observed must be due to the independent variable, as this is the only thing that differs systematically between the experimental conditions. A second method of doing cross-cultural research is within group manipulation. Each participant receives more than one level of the independent variable. Within group manipulation does not require random assignment because each participant receives each level of the independent variable. Each participant also acts as their own control. Past research has explored cultural messages in domains as diverse as magazine advertisements. This is an Oreo commercial from Korea. <clears throat> this Han and Shavit did this in 1994. This is probably something that you wouldn't see in the United States. But, of course, there's a baby with an Oreo cookie, and he's drinking from his mother's breast. Probably not something that you would see in the United States, mainly because you can see part of her nipple, which is a little strange. Uh, sexual mores are, are just fascinating if you study them all around the world. This is far, completely acceptable in, 
in Asia, and it would be acceptable in most parts of Europe, but not in the United States. Past research has explored cultural messages and domains as diverse as laws. Uh, this is uh, something that was done by Cohen in 1996. China passed a law in 2013 that adult children must visit their parents often. Now that's kind of an odd law to pass since we have to define what often is. Um, if you really don't like your, your mother and, and uh, you're trying to fulfill this law, does that mean that you have to go once a year, twice a year, four times a year, once a quarter? You know, what, what, what is often? Past research has explored cultural messages and domains as diverse as newspaper articles. This was done by Morris and Ping in 1994. Most headlines around the world were about President Trump's inauguration, uh, but after the countries, but from their po country's point of view. And as you can see, uh, the Canadians weren't all that happy with uh, Donald J. Trump. Past research has explored cultural messages and domains as diverse as fairy tales. This was done by Doyle and Doyle in uh, 2001. The oldest written fairy tale is Abdullah the Fisherman and Abdullah the Merman written in 850 AD in Persia. Past research has explored cultural messages and domains as diverse as children's stories. And this was done by McClelland in 1961. Past research has explored cultural messages and domains as diverse as sports coverage. Marcus Uchida, I think shouldn't be that way. Uh, I'm sorry, I should have uh, fixed that. Should be Marcus et al. in 2006. And there's uh, Leon Messi, Leo, the, one of the greatest goal scorers. He worked, He plays for Paris Saint Germain now, I think. And his old team, no, his old old team is Barcelona. It was Real Madrid, Madrid that won the Champions League this year. Past research has explored cultural messages and domains as diverse as personal ads, and this is. Parekh and Barrison in 2001. Past research has explored cultural messages and domains as diverse as web pages. Masuda Ito and Rashid in 2012. That should be Masuda et al. in 2012. <coughs> A key point to realize about research is that no single study is perfect. Every study has potential methodological shortcomings or alternative <coughs> theoretical explanations. One important skill that students learn in graduate school in psychology is precisely how to come up with alternative explanations for vir virtually any study they encounter. In science, researchers and readers of research use the principle of Occam's razor to help with determining the quality of research. Occam's razor states that any theory should make as few assumptions as possible, shaving off any extraneous assumptions. Uh, all else held equal, Occam's razor maintains that the simpler theory is probably the more correct. Following Occam's razor, a single explanation is more parsimonious and more likely to be correct than four separate explanations. Research has always shown that the South is the most violent region in the United States and that this has been true since the very founding of the nation. And this was something that de Tocqueville noticed when he did his, uh, when he wandered around the United States in 1835. While violence exists in other regions of the country, the Old West, the South, has the, the uh, nation, uh, has led the nation in lynchings, sniper attacks, feuds, homicides, and duels. Of course, uh, just last week, we had two mass shootings. One was in Buffalo, New York, and the other was in Uvalde, Texas. Andrew Jackson, the man that's on the $20 bill, once killed a man in a duel over the honor of his wife, who at the time was married to both Jackson and her first husband, uh, while she waited for her divorce to be finalized. Ugh. So he shot at him and killed him. Uh, Fisher, in 1989, speculates that the South has always had more tolerance for aggressive pursuits. Reports from the colonial days chronicle no-holds-barred uh, fights where eyes were gouged and noses and ears were bitten off, or purring, uh, where two men held each other's shoulders and kicked each other in the shins until they let go. Now, one of the things you do when, when you do purring is you put straw in your sh as shin guards. 
of course you can't wear shin guards. This is, sounds like a soccer game. The South has always been more tolerant than the North concerning corporal punishment of children, uh, capital punishment of criminals, gun ownership, going to war whenever the gauntlet is mentioned. Southern high school students are more likely to bring a weapon to school, as we saw in Uvalde, Texas. The South has more school shootings than any place else. There have been several theories as to why the South has evolved one way and the rest of the country another. Hot, uncomfortable temperatures. This was uh, thought, uh, thought up by Anderson in 1989. Uh, greater poverty. poverty. Uh, De Tocqueville mentioned this in 1835. Longer history of slavery where there is a tolerance for inhumane treatment. And, of course, uh, De Tocqueville also noticed that in 1835. Nisbet and Cohen in 1996 posit that one factor that has led to more violence in the South is that the South was settled by herders, which has given rise to a culture of honor. A culture of honor is one where men strive to protect their reputation through being aggressive. Herders are more susceptible to violence because their wealth is more portable where the land is more marginal. Thus, it is important for herders to develop a reputation of violent retaliation to keep thieves away from their wealth, a culture of honor. The sense of honor has to be established before your wealth is affected. Thus, you need to be violent before anyone tries to steal your livestock. The herder culture of honor is not limited uh, to the United States, but may have been brought here by the Scots-Irish, who made up the lion's share of people settling in the South. They were herders in the old country. Uh, herders around the world maintained this bloviated code of honor. Looking at the archival data, Nisbet and Cohen in 1997 found that when you compared records of rural north with the rural south, they found that not only was the homicide rate higher, but when they compared herding regions of the south with farming regions of the south, the homicide rate was twice that in the herding region. Cohen and Nisbet in 1994 next conducted telephone interviews of Northerners and Southerners and discovered that while they had similar negative feelings about violence, Southerners were more likely to have positive attitudes toward defending their families or their honor. Noting that testosterone rises when men are ready to aggress, Nisbet and Cohen et al. in 1996 arranged for Northern and Southern students to be put in a vaguely ins insulting situation. He then measured the testosterone of each participant. Measuring testosterone from saliva samples, the researchers discovered that while the northern students reacted minimally to the insult uh, from 4 to 5 milligrams, the southern students were ready to aggress after the insult to a testosterone level of 12.5 from a level of 4 milligrams. So the northern students didn't, uh, didn't their testosterone, test, testosterone level did not go up after they were insulted. The southerners, it went up uh, by as much as three, uh, two to three uh, times. But the northerners didn't, uh, didn't uh, respond. Cohen and his colleagues in 1996 conducted a similar study where they forced the participants into a narrow hallway with a much larger person. What they were measuring was how long it took the participants to step out of the Man Mountain's way, a game of human chicken. The situation was set up by either insulting the participant before they played hallway chicken or not. Northerners reacted in a similar manner whether they were insulted or not. Uh, they stepped out of the way 60 to 75 inches, respectively. Southerners, on the other hand, stepped out of the way earlier when not insulted, 110 inches, Southern his hospitality, of course, but after an insult, they approached the Man Mountain on, on an average of 35 inches before veering off. off. This is the culture of honor in play. And that is the end of the chapter. As fascinating as that is, this is all really important to me because I am married to a woman from Georgia. And there you go. Okay, so let's go ahead and get go ahead, start the second chapter. This one is about the development and socialization. <clears throat> Let's go back. There we go. That's what it looks like. Zebras, the most dangerous animals at the zoo. And the reason they're the most dangerous is because they bite. 
And when they bite, they don't let go. So they take a chunk out of people. So if you work at a zoo, uh, stay away from the zebras. <laughs> You're better off with the crocodiles. Uh, one key ad adaptation that enabled uh, humans to distinguish themselves from their proto-chimpanzee ancestors was the ability to learn and ac ac accumulate cultural information so well. This adaptation allowed humans to learn the requisite technologies and skills to stake out a successful existence in, uh, in such diverse environments as the ice-encased Arctic hinterland, uh, the thick Amazonian jungle, the parched Kalahari desert, and the dog-eat-dog -dog corporate uh, world of Wall Street. One of the things that they just discovered uh, in the Amazon, um, and, and people have speculated about this before, but the Amazon doesn't look like it's a very fertile area. Uh, but what they have discovered is that uh, uh, pre-Columbian, uh, the uh, Amazon Valley was, uh, was settled by, by people, um, a, a lot of people, uh, evidently, and uh, what they've discovered is uh, that they built up mounds in, the, in the, these moist areas that don't have uh, very good soil. And they brought in uh, good soil so that they could grow food. Um, and this was fairly extensive. Um, people have been speculating about this for the last 20 or 30 years, but, you know, people... Archaeologists wanted proof. Uh, scientists didn't want it. Historians didn't like the idea that there were that they, that uh, that uh, the indigenous people of the Americas were, were that settled. Uh, I actually put this in my dissertation when I was talking about uh, what it was like uh, pre-Columbian. Uh, but there weren't a lot of takers. Um, there there weren't a lot of people in the historical community or the or the uh, archaeological community that agreed with me because there weren't a lot of people. It's not like I came up with this idea. Uh, I got it from somebody else, uh, but I, I repeated it as, as if it might be true, uh, just as, a, as, as an idea. And uh, now it's been proven that uh, that, uh, that guy was right. And since he was right and I agreed with him, I was right too. <laughs> <laughs> so I, this is all new stuff. Uh, they did lidar, and what they discovered was that uh, that uh, they built um, mounds of dirt, uh, and they brought in, like I said, they brought in um, uh, fertile dirt from somewhere else, and uh, they built civilizations in the Amazon. Uh, they they discovered it with lidar, evidently. Um, one of the reasons that, uh, that uh, it's difficult to tell what happened in the past is if you live in a culture that doesn't use uh, things that are permanent, like stone or steel or, or whatever, if they used wood and, and, uh, wood and dirt and whatnot, it's difficult to, to prove that this, this pile of dirt had anything to do with anyone or this, this stick had anything to do with anyone. Uh, so that's what they were looking for. That's one of the reasons why arrowheads were so important. Um, because it proved that uh, and they could uh, carbon date them where they were, and they could determine uh, how long that uh, that arrowhead had been around and who who made it and where it was made. Uh, they could also prove where the uh, stone came from, and that's always interesting. Anyway, so the thick Amazonian jungle, the parched Kalahari desert, the dog eat dog corporate world of Wall Street, of course. A uh, sensitive period is a period of time in an orga organism's development that allows for the relatively easy acquisition of a set of skills. If an organism misses that chance to acquire those skills, it would have a difficult time doing so later after the sensitive period has expired. And this is one of the reasons why it's so difficult to learn a language after the age of 12. You have Your brain is organized to, uh, to develop language. And uh, this portion is, if you don't use it by the time you're 12 years old, then uh, you lose that portion of your brain. It gets, it gets uh, paired out. There's really no reason for it uh, unless you're continually trying to learn new pieces of information uh, or learn new languages. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why I have such a difficult time with languages. I can pick up s select words. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I would love to be able to speak French, but I could, would, wouldn't be able to speak it with the right, uh, 
accent, I'm afraid. Uh, human culture learning uh, continues throughout the lifespan, of course. Uh, language ability is a hallmark uh, human characteristic, and although there are rudimentary language skills in some other species, no other species is as dependent on language skills or has a complex uh, as complex a language system as humans do. Humans are capable of producing, <clears throat> recognizing, and using approximately 150 phonemes, units of sound. That's what a phoneme is. It's a unit of sound uh, in communication. However, no language uses more than 70 of them. People are not able to discriminate easily between phonemes that are not their own language. The Japanese language does not have separate phonemes for the sounds LA and RA. Likewise, the Japanese language does not have a phoneme for VA, although it does have a phoneme for BA. An adult who is exposed only to the Japanese language cannot perceive the differences between LAs and RAs, or between BAs and VAs, phonemes that sound obviously different in English speakers. To the Japanese, rubber is indistinguishable from lover because they don't have the V and the B sound. Uh, potentially, this is going to work. This is from, uh, what is that movie? A Christmas Story, one of my favorites. Okay, It's my son's favorite movie, strangely enough. Sing like this. Deck the horse with bows of holly. Fa la 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 la. Try again. Deck the horse with bows of holly. Fa la 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 la. Stop 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 stop. Sing something else. Jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a horsey old horseman sleigh! No, 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 stop, 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 stop. Kitchen, bring food. Oh. <laughs> Yes, it, it, it's a beautiful duck. Yes, it, it really is. It's uh, uh but you see, it, uh, what? It, it's smiling at me. <laughs> Christmas would live in our memories as the Christmas when we were introduced to Chinese turkey. All was right with the world. Uh, I was just reading uh, uh, Left Handed uh, Son of Old Man Hat. Uh, and they were talking about uh, eating. Um, they were talking about eating uh, uh, goat, and uh, they were saying that. Uh, uh, the uh, left-handed came back from herding, and people had, had, had been visiting his family, and they had butchered a goat, and there was no meat left. There wasn't even any head, hooves, or, or uh, uh, any, any other portion. All the meat was gone, uh, which, you know, that's what you're supposed to do with meat. You're supposed to eat the whole thing. But uh, just like in China, where uh, you, <laughs> one of the reasons why you cook the uh, the duck with the head on is so that you can show that it was a fresh duck. That's the reason. Anyway, not important. Uh, okay. Oops. Uh, in Celtic, uh, crag, uh, where does English come from? It comes from Celtic, yeah, crag, bog, whiskey, penguin, clan, plaid, shamrock, slogan, trousers galore. These are all Celtic words. Uh, Anglo-Saxon, apple, blood, cheerleader, iron, uh, jump are words that come from Anglo-Saxon. Uh, we get a lot of words from the uh, Scandinavian countries, the Vikings, 
uh, ugly knife, uh, die, uh, cake, skull, the, the days of the week. Those are all Viking words. Uh, from Latin, we get lots of words from the Latin. Uh, have, agriculture, uh, casino, bonus, and fame. Uh, French, uh, of course, the Normans conquered uh, uh, England in 1066. Uh, and from the French, we get priest, infantry, money, jury, aisle, and music. Actually, uh, French was spoken by the royal house. And for the longest time, uh, uh, the French words and English words, or, or Anglo-Saxon words, you could either use one or the other. And if you were talking to uh, somebody in the royal family or officially, uh, you would speak French. But if you were speaking to somebody uh, on the street, you'd speak in Anglo-Saxon. Uh, it's really fascinating to look at uh, how all of these words evolved. Uh, people, When people say, pardon my French, and they're talking about swear words, Almost all the swear words in, in English are actually Anglo-Saxon. They're not French at all. Um, so, and I could, I used to go through that, but I'm, or, or, and talk about, you know, feces. Feces is actually a uh, Latin word. Um, and, of course, the Anglo-Saxon word, the German word for, uh, for feces is scheiße. Uh, so you can take everything in between and... <laughs> The French word for, for feces is manure, so, you know, anyway. Researchers suggest uh, that young infants can discriminate among all the phonemes that humans are able to produce. Native English-speaking babies of six to eight months can reliably distinguish between two sounds from the Hindi language, but 10 to 12-month-old native English speakers cannot. Even four-day-old infants already show a preference for the rhythm of sounds from their own language over other languages. And this is this they learn in the womb. This research suggests that we are biologically prepared to attend to human speech as we come into this world. We are predisposed to start picking up languages at an early age. Early in life, before puberty, our brains are especially pliable for organizing themselves in response to language input. Later on, our brains are not as flexible. Of course, we lose this at about age 12. It really all depends on who you are and whether you speak more than one language. Humans are better at acquiring and mastering languages early in life, and that's what I was just talking about. For bilinguals who learn their second language later in life, one part of the brain is active when they hear their second language and another when they hear their native language. Both parts are in Broca's area. And this is Broca's area right here. It's on the left side of your brain, left hemisphere, uh, just uh, between your, your ear and your eye. Uh, bilinguals who, who learn their second language early in life showed activation in the same part of the brain, regardless of whether they were hearing their second language or their native language. Keller in 2007 looked at the rearing practices of urban middle-class Germans, Greeks, Costa Ricans, rural Indian Gujarati, and Cameroonians, observing how much bo uh, bodily contact the parents had with the infants. Keller found that European parents spend the least time in contact with their infants. And this is a German mother, and we can tell that because the baby has on, that's the German soccer team, whoops, I'm sorry. Uh, wait a minute. There we go. Let me get my arrow back. This is the symbol of the German soccer team. They usually wear black and white. And she's blonde. Well, she's not really blonde. She's got brown hair. But we'll we'll, we'll assume that she's she's a good German lady, and that's a good German baby because he's got a German uh, soccer uniform on. Uh, the infants from the other culture, cultural groups uh, spent the majority of their time being held by their mothers. During Keller's observation in 2007, uh, there was not a single observation where the Cameroonian infant wasn't being held by his mother. And this is a teacher, of course, and she's got her baby on her back. Another variable that Keller investigated was the amount of face-to-face -face contact the mothers had with their infants. Urban 
uh, European uh, mothers spent most of their contact time in face-to-face -face contact. This is not true of other mothers, especially the Gujarati, and this is a Gujarati woman, a woman uh, and uh, she's making nose-to-nose -nose contact with her baby, but this is not common. Uh, they normally do carry their babies around, but it's not a face-to-face -face situation. The responses of the German mothers were more contingent to the baby's cries and behaviors than was found with the Cameroonian mothers, and this cultural difference predicted how quickly the babies learned to recognize themselves in a mirror. The more responsive their mothers were to their cries, the younger the child was, the uh, child was able to show self-recognition skills. Learning that others will respond to their cries facilitates uh, infants' recognition that they have a distinct identity. Urban European babies tend to occupy their own physical space, and they are often in face-to-face -face contact with their mothers, putting them in a position to interact with their mothers as separate beings, as in turn-taking uh, turn conversations, and their mothers are more responsive to their individual needs. In other cultures, infants share the same physical space with their mothers. Mothers are not as likely to be in a position to interact with their infants through face-to-face -face contact because they carry them on their backs. In some regions of Africa, the Caribbean, and India, infants receive a daily massage and exercise regime. Uh, such as stretching their limbs or putting them into sitting positions. These experiences shape their development and those who receive this kind of massage and exercise begin to sit on their own and walk at an earlier age than those that do not. For some reason I got the idea that, that uh, I wanted to watch my kids walk. I had studied psychology and I had read that uh, babies can walk at birth or uh, they make walking uh, movements and I used to do that. I used to walk with my kids in between, you know, I was holding them up uh, by uh, under each armpit and let them just walk around. And uh, one of my kids started walking at seven months and the other one started walking at eight months. And it probably had something to do with the fact that I was exercising them to walk. Cultural practices such as putting infants to sleep on their backs rather than their stomachs can delay when children begin to crawl roll over or learn to stand. Now one of the weird things about uh, about uh, my uh, my kids was that they never crawled. <laughs> they never crawled and they never did any other movement except walking. They just kind of stood up and took off. In cultures that do not encourage crawling, large pr proportions of the children never crawl but instead scoot along on their butts or proceed uh, directly to walking. That's what happened with my kids. They proceeded directly to walking. But uh, my niece, uh, who was exactly the same age as my son, uh, would scoot along around on her butt. It was just the oddest thing. I, uh, I saw a baby doing this. I was at a bookstore in, uh, in Bettendorf the other day and, and this baby was scooting around on her butt. And I just thought it was the oddest thing. Uh, you don't really see that a whole lot. I, I'm not around a lot of kids, toddlers, uh, so I don't see that at all, but uh, it was really kind of odd. If you are in a European descent and grew up in, Nor in a North American household, the odds are that your parents set aside a room in their house, perhaps decorating it with pastel colors and scenes of romping bunny rabbits, and put a crib in it for you to sleep in. In a study of 136 societies, infants in two-thirds of these groups slept in the same bed as their mothers. In the majority of the other cases, infants slept in the same room as their mothers, but in a different bed. American parents were the only ones in a survey of 100 societies who created a separate room for the baby to sleep in. The practices of co-sleeping is also quite common in other subcultures in the United States, African Americans, Asian Americans, and Hispanics tend to sleep with their babies. The practice of people sleeping separately in their own beds has not yet been identified in a single, single subsistence society around the world. Schwader et al. in 1995 uh, developed a study where they gave participants a scenario as to how to house a family in three bedrooms consisting of a mother, a father, a son of 15, a son of 11, a son of 8, a daughter of 14, and a daughter of 3. 
Now, how in the world would you put these people together? 88% of the Americans, given the scenario, chose the following configuration. In room one, the father and the mother slept. In room two, the two daughters share the room. In room three, the three sons share the room. And this is known as the Brady Bunch solution, because if you ever watched the television show Brady Bunch, the girls slept in one room, the boys slept in another room, and mom and dad slept together. Americans seek to avoid incest. The second most important principle was the sacred couple, of course. Married couples should be given their own space for emotional intimacy and sexual privacy. The third most important principle is, is the autonomy, uh, the belief that uh, young children who are needy and vulnerable should learn to be self-reliant and take care of themselves. When people in India were given the same scenario, they based their answers on the following four criteria. Incest avoidance. Post-pubescent children of the opposite sex should not sleep in the same room. Protection to the, of the vulnerable. Young children should not be left alone at night. Female chastity anxiety. Post-pubescent females should always be chaperoned. And respect for hierarchy. Post-pubescent boys are conferred social status by not having them sleep with parents or young children. One of the most popular configurations from India involved in bedroom one, the mother, the father, and the three-year-old daughter. In bedroom two, the 14-year-old daughter and the eight-year-old son. In bedroom three, the 15-year-old son and the 11-year-old uh, 11 son. The second popular Indian configuration involved bedroom one, father and the eight-year-old son. In bedroom two, the 15-year-old son and the 11-year-old son. In bedroom three, the mother, the three-year-old daughter, and the 14-year-old daughter. North American children live in an environment where they are by themselves from a very early age and must cry out to their parents when they have needs to be taken care of. Children from many other cultures, in contrast, may live in an environment where their mother is always around. Often, as in many cultures, the children are literally carried by their mother throughout the day. Mothers do not need to be called to as they are always present to respond to the child's needs. In 1971, Baumrin published their tripartite typology of parenting styles. Authoritarian parenting, low levels of warmth or responsiveness by parents to the child's protests, authoritative parenting, child-centered approach, the parents maintain high expectations of maturity for their children, and the permissive parenting. Parents are very involved with their children. Much expressed parental warmth and responsiveness. Parents place few limits and controls on their children's behavior. Uh -oh. Hey, Rox. What's up? Hello? While Western parents are sorry, that was my daughter calling. That's an odd ring. While Western parents are more dem demonstrative than most other parents, Chow in 1994 argues that training is a core part of Chinese parenting. It is an effort uh, to have the children adhere to socially desirable behaviors, often by providing the child with explicit examples of proper behavior, and it entails uh, much devotion and sacrifice on the part of the parents. Contrary to Western findings, strong parental control has been found to be associated with increased family cohesion, perceived parental warmth and acceptance, and better academic achievement in China, Japan, and Korea. Parenting styles, uh, European American high, high school students viewed uh, any pressure from their mother to be largely negative and indicative that they didn't feel supported by their mothers. Asian American high school students didn't view the maternal pressure in negative terms. When Asian American students reflected on their mothers pressuring them uh, to work hard on a task, they were more motivated to complete a task on their own. Japanese adolescents even feel rejected by their parents when they experience only little parental control and a broad range of autonomy. However, authoritarian parenting styles, as defined by Baumrind in 1971, have been found to be associated with more stress. Call from 
from Roxy. Hello? Hello? Right. What? Okay. 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 I think I think your mom knows. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Is that it? Right, right. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Bye. All right. Sorry, that was my daughter. <laughs> We're trying to figure out. It's the last day of school on Thursday. So. However, authoritarian parenting styles are defined by Baumrin have been found to be associated with more stressed mothers. Uh, and to lead the increased psychological maladjustment among children across a variety of both Western and non-Western cultures, including Chinese. In general, children are less happy with strongly controlling parents, and this effect is found across many cultures. There are obvious uh, differences between the parenting philosophies of North American and Chinese parents. North American children come to learn that they are independent agents to which their mothers respond, whereas the Chinese children learn that they are relational beings who need to respond to their mothers. North American mothers are more likely to discuss their child's successes and positive emotional experiences with them, thereby emphasizing what the child is able to accomplish. Chinese mothers are more likely to call attention to their child, child's mistakes and, and transgressions, uh, thereby elaborating on how the child needs to change uh, to fit in better. Around the age of 18 months, young children enter a period of accelerated word learning when their vocabularies begin to increase dramatically. A great deal of research has been indicated, has indicated that this increase in vocabulary is not disturbed uh, equally across all different forms of words. The first words that children learn are nouns. There is a great deal of evidence that North American children tend to learn nouns much quicker than verbs. Chinese children were found to use more verbs than nouns. There is no noun bias among Korean toddlers. The structure of English is such that nouns tend to come in rather salient locations, such as at the end of sentences. East Asian languages such as Japanese and Korean tend to place uh, verbs in salient positions at the end of, end of sentences. Unlike in English, the Chinese, Japanese, and Korean languages allow for nouns and pronouns to be dropped when the context is clear. Westerners tend to perceive the world in a more analytic fashion, seeing objects as discrete and separate, whereas East Asians are more likely to perceive the world in holistic terms stressing the relations between objects. It is plausible that the cultural, cultural differences and noun bias reflect this difference in thinking and the world. Japanese toddlers have been shown to, have, uh, to make fewer demands on their parents than their American counterparts and are less likely to assert, to assert their disobedience. Those occasions when uh, Japanese toddlers do act unruly tend to, be, to not be viewed as signs of blossoming individuality, but rather as indicators of their own immaturity. The developmental goal embraced by Japanese parents is much less a desire to see their children learn how to individuate and assert themselves than it is for them to learn how to accommodate to others and to become part of a harmonious, of a harmonious social group. Many cultures demonstrated tendencies for adolescents to act in their rebellious ways familiar to the West. However, this was by no means universal. Rather, expectations for such antisocial behaviors were present in only 44% of societies with respect to boys and in only 18% of societies for girls. 
The majority of cultures studied did not expect adolescents to behave especially disobediently. The notion that adolescence is universally associated with violence received little support. Rather, only 13% of societies expected adolescent boys to occasionally be violent, and only 3% of societies had such expectations for girls. The experiences of adolescents in Germany, Scotland, Japan, uh, Bali, and Batak were compared, and the results indicated that both individualism and modernity seemed to increase the difficulties in adolescence. In particular, there appears to be more conflict between children and their parents in individualistic societies, where children seem to view parental control as a constraint they must resist. There seems to be increased adolescent uh, distress, especially due to the sheer range of opportunities that confront children as societies industrialize and become more, more urbanized. One task in adolescence is to learn how to accept adult roles. This is much more straightforward when there are fewer roles, fewer role distinctions, and when youths are more uh, uh, in contact with adults, as they are in uh, more traditional agricultural societies. The number of choices has continued to grow, which has lengthened the period of adolescence, sometimes referred to as failure to launch or emerging adulthood. The transition to adulthood has been marked by five milestones, completing school, leaving home, becoming financially independent, getting married, having at least one child. Um, I did most of these by the time I was 19. I had a child at, at 19, I turned 20 the next month, but uh, so all of these I did before I was 19. In the United States in 1960, 77% of the women and 65% of the men had passed all five milestones by the age of 30. In 2000, fewer than half of the women and less than one third of the men had done so by this age. East Asian children spent more days in school, 240 days per year in Japan versus 180 days per year in the United States. A greater percentage of class uh, time was devoted to math education in Asian school uh, day uh, in the Asian school day than in the American school day. Asian teachers spent a greater percentage of time lecturing in the classroom compared with their American counterparts, 90% in Taiwan compared to 46% in the United States. Asian math lessons, approximately 80% of, of examples, were real world in Japan, compared with about 10% of examples in American classes. Asian teachers assigned more homework to students. Uh, fifth graders in the United States had less than half as much homework assigned to them as Taiwanese students. Asian parents seem to view education as more central to their children's lives than American parents do. Asian parents are more likely to provide their children with a desk. One study revealed that 98% of Taiwanese fifth graders had a desk in their home, compared with only 63% of American kids. Stevenson in 1992 asked fifth graders to imagine that there was a wizard who would grant them anything they wished uh, anything that they wished for. About 70% of the wishes listed by Chinese students had to do with education. They wished for success in school or to be able to go to college. In contrast, only about 10% of American children wished for things relevant to education. About 10% of American children wished for less school. East Asian children are doing much better as a group on math tests than American children, thus one might expect East Asian mothers to be especially satisfied with their children's performance. This does not seem to be the case. Rather, the American mothers report being far more satisfied with their children's performance than the East Asian mothers. Compared with mothers of the first grade children, Chinese and Japanese mothers of fifth grade children reported that higher standard of achievement was necessary for them to be satisfied with their children's math performance. In stark contrast, the standards of American mothers were lower for fifth grade children than first grade children. <clears throat> it appears to be far easier to, to meet standards of American mothers than East Asian mothers. <clears throat> 
This would suggest that American children have less a reason to work hard at their studies than East Asian children. Numbers are harder to learn in English than in Japanese, Korean, or Chinese because there are more irregular number words in English. East Asian counting systems incorporate the base 10 concept, which is necessary for learning how to do multi-digit arithmetic in a more straightforward way than English does. Thus, English speakers need more conceptual support for the base 10 concept than do speakers of East Asian languages. And that is the end of the chapter.